everybody on this Labor Day weekend. How many people here know the history of Labor Day? Okay, that was overwhelming. Thank you. All right, that was overwhelming. You know, we, uh, we asked our eight-year-old granddaughter if she knew the history of Labor Day and she thought it had something to do with having babies. So apparently, so apparently we're not getting the word across in schools, but seriously, Labor Day is a very significant holiday and has become simply observed as the last summer holiday. It's kind of the end of summer, school has started, all of those things. But in essence, Labor Day was really established in the 1880s to really honor the union movements in this nation. All right. And quite frankly, uh, Labor Day was started by the Machinist Union. All right. There you go, how about that? Yes, the Machinist Union. <laughs> Actually, there's a dispute there's a dispute. The Carpenters Union claims they started it. The Machinist Union claims they started it, okay? So the question is, who actually started it? We really don't know. The research tells us, I look at the history, it looks like it was the Machinist Union, uh, but if there's anyone here in the Carpenters Union, please don't try to beat up any machinists you run into. The reality is, it was to honor the contribution of organized labor. And one of the early, earliest uh, testaments to that was the idea that it was through organized labor this country was built, and that's very true. If you took organized labor out of the picture, if you took organized labor out of the picture over all these years, what would we have in this nation? And that goes to two areas of life. First, what would we have in terms of the rights and benefits and protection of workers? And secondly, what would we have in the great industrial manufacturing strength of this country? The answer is we would be a much different nation and a much less prosperous nation, and probably would not have ever seen the true emergence of a true middle class without organized labor. But more than that, when there was great exploitation in our urban areas, <coughs> as manufacturing became sites of exploitation, it was organized labor that gave us child labor laws, that gave us hours of work laws, that gave us the idea of workers' compensation. So on this Labor Day, I would seriously ask all of us to stop and truly appreciate the role that organized labor has played in American life. And the Methodist Church was very closely tied into these early movements in urban areas, uh, assisting in these factories that were actually sweatshops, uh, factories that were using children to labor, People were put, being put in dangerous, dangerous situations, the meatpacking business being one that is classic, highly dangerous environments. Had it not been for the involvement of organized labor and the involvement of the Methodist Church who went into these urban areas, went into these sweatshops, uh, quite frankly, it'd be a much different nation today. Many lives would have been lost, families ruined. And so Labor Day really is a day we have to stop and, and be grateful for that. And so I say happy Labor Day to all of you. And uh, sadly, it is the last holiday of summer. Uh, but it is a time to, <coughs> like any other holiday, secular holiday, it's a time to reflect and a time to, uh, really a time to honor those who have helped build the nation that we have. 
So, as we begin today, though, we begin with a very powerful affirmation. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Right, now we do have several announcements this morning. First of all, hang on to your hats. This is big news. Um, Salem will be celebrating its 179th birthday this month. Thank you. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Our um, and it's interesting because Church of Four Seasons just celebrated their 40th anniversary. Okay? Now, my pants are 40 years old. And so the reality is 179 is a big deal. And next year, it will be 180. And that's quite an accomplishment. We are one of the oldest churches in the Indiana Conference. In fact, we are no doubt probably in the top five in terms of churches in the Indiana Conference. The only ones that may exceed us just a bit are churches that might have been established by circuit riders. And circuit riders in Indiana, we had five different circuits, all in southern Indiana. Uh, generally along streams and rivers, so they all bear that kind of a name. Uh, so the fact of the matter is we are in that, that top cadre of churches. Now to celebrate that this year on our 179th birthday, we're having a country breakfast. Some of you may remember back in the days when Salem would do a country breakfast. Uh, we're having a country breakfast on September 23rd from 8 to 11. And this is the menu, okay? Biscuits and gravy, hash browns, scrambled eggs, <coughs> fruit, coffee, and juice. All for the discounted price of $9 per person, ages five to 12, $5, and under five, free, okay? And I know none of you are under five, so don't try to get in for free. We will have tickets available in the near future. Awesome. So please, mark that on your calendar, September 23rd, 8 a.m. Uh, to 11 a.m. right here at the church. We're gonna celebrate, have a great time. We want this place packed. As it is for our pancake breakfast every year, let's pack the place, let's celebrate 179 years, celebrate the fact that this church will be here hopefully for another, another 179 years. Now, I do have just a couple of the quick announcements and then a very important announcement. Uh, once again, please pray about serving in one of our ministries as liturgist, as coffee hour host or hostess, uh, family and friends, fun night host or hostess, so please pray about that seriously and uh, take some time to sign up. It is, a, you know, it's nothing that uh, you cannot, you know, it's something everyone can do. If you're uncomfortable standing up here, and uh, then be a host or hostess for coffee hour or family and friends night, something like that. There's a role for everyone. Yes, Donna. We have two things. Uh, the calendars are on those back again. And I just tidbit about the unions and the regulations. Years ago, there was a movie, Sylvester Stallone, I think it was in it, called Fist. And it was about organizing. And in the movie, he plays a hairy person. So he gets married in the movie, he wants an authentic. Talking now, is that the idea? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, hi, there we go. <coughs> yes, thank you. She was talking about the movie, it's called Fist, correct? And a, a priest that had been, a local 
priest, was very much involved with organized labor, went to Holy, uh, ultimately went to Holy Trinity Church in Chicago. And it just underscores the relationship of faith and organized labor in this nation. Can everyone hear me over the air conditioner? Okay. What? What? <laughs> I heard that. Did you hear me made up? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. I do have a very, very special announcement this morning. All right. Johanna Williams and Rodney Williams, uh, the sister and brother of Lake Joan. Yes. Not, no, Elaine. Elaine. Oh, Elaine? Yeah, not Johanna. Oh, I'm sorry. Elaine. Yes, I should remember that. I'm sorry. I was thinking of Johanna. Okay. All right. Yeah, Johanna's the one who's passed away. Okay. No, I apologize for that. I started to say the estate of Johanna Williams, acting through the good offices of Elaine Grado and uh, Rodney Williams, uh, have uh, are making a gift to Salem United Methodist Church. This was at Johanna's request. It comes as a direction from the estate. Um, so. Elaine, would you like to come forward here for a moment? <laughs> Laura? The, uh, the estate has directed a gift of $10,000 to Salem United Methodist Church to be placed in the general fund savings account. It was Johanna's desire that these funds would be used for operating expenses. And uh, we certainly thank the estate, and we uh, are very appreciative of that. So, yeah. <laughs> so yes, this was uh, this was kind of a surprise to me, and I appreciate surprises, especially when they come with ten thousand dollars. But thank you very much, and please, uh, Elaine, extend to the extend to Rodney and of the estate, uh, the deepest appreciation of the church, and certainly we will uh, we will certainly send our formal appreciation. And uh, it's a, a wonderful gift. And I think it's important, I know in one of my last conversations with Johanna, she was, she was obviously very interested in the continuation of the church, and very much interested in the ability of the church to meet our ongoing operating expenses. Uh, we had talked at one time about what kind of memorial gift she wanted, uh, and the memorial gift she wanted was this church to be here for another 179 years. So, we thank you. Welcome. And I apologize, I called you Johanna. But, uh, and thank you, Johanna. Yes, thank That's you, great. Johanna, and I'm sure she's listening. All right, that being said, let us now greet one another with the love and peace of Christ. Well, hello. Well, hello and good morning. Glad to see that you're back. Did you find your way home? <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Oh, don't get up. 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 Good morning, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. We call it independent. All right. That's all we can do. How are you doing? Good. Hey, John. How are you doing? Okay. That long time since I took a half of it. Yeah, all over. Ten minutes. Four or five minutes. How about that? You're in charge. 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 You
what he has done. Sing, sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength, seek his face always. Please join us in our opening hymn, Because He Lives, 364, verses 1, 2, and 3, with an introduction. <laughs> Thank you. 
This is that time when we pause and reflect on the witness of God in our lives and the way in which our lives witness God. In the things that we do, in the things that we say, in the love that we extend, in the hospitality we offer, and the service we give <coughs> on to God's kingdom. Now today I begin, of course, with a joy, not just for the contribution <coughs> from the estate of Johanna Williams, but for Johanna. And I think she really epitomized what it means to be part of Salem United Methodist Church. One of a few people who spent her entire life in this church. Baptized here, confirmed here, grew up here. This was a formative part of her life as it was for several of you. And no matter what her physical condition, and toward the end it was a very difficult physical condition, we know the last four years were very trying for Johanna and very difficult. But yet, even in that, she never lost faith. And that is the true test of faith. Can you still witness your faith in acts of love and kindness? She was very concerned and very interested in this church. She loved this church. And she loved this church with a true and a deep love. Every time you would walk into her house, that, that painting was very prominent. Sitting on the couch, she would always be looking at it. And she would always tell me, you know, when I pass on, that painting is to be at the church, to stay at the church. And I just would like to, to stop and think of all of the Johanna Williams who have made this church. We're only sitting here today because this miraculous cloud of witnesses who went before us. In 179 years, there have been a lot of Johanna Williams at Salem when a church burns down in 1903, it's rebuilt in just a few months. When a church withstands a Great Depression, when churches are going bankrupt, losing everything. The Johanna Williams of this congregation have kept it going, and they will keep it going today. So let us look at her gift to this church as her entire life. And that's really what God is calling us to do. Your life is an offering unto God because that life belongs to God. And so again, we're very appreciative of what her estate has done. And we're even more appreciative of what her life has done. And that's my joy today. Other joys and concerns this morning? I would remind, yes, Penny. Yeah. Um, I would like prayers for my son and his family, Roger Foster. Uh, my son's dad, my ex-husband, passed away last night after a nine-month battle with lung cancer. Thank you. We will pray for Roger. Yes. Thank you. All right. Also, uh, this week, we will have the um, interment of Velda Fitzgerald, who is Janet Snowden's mom. That will be on Thursday of this week. We pray for that entire family as they celebrate a life, a life lived well. Uh, she was well into her 90s, I understand. 96. 96. A life lived well, and a life lived with great purpose and intentionality. So we will pray for the family. Anyone else this morning? Yes. Uh, prayers for Jean Turnbull that she will pass easily. Okay. Um, yes, very interesting. Um, Mary, that would be your cousin, correct? Yeah, her husband is Her husband, Tom, yes. Yeah, it's very interesting. I received a call um, just a, about a week and a half ago from an individual who had been one of the founding members of Church of Four Seasons. And it happens to be Mary's cousin, a man named Tom Turnbull. And he was very involved when that church was built and constructed. His wife, Jeannie, um, is in the last stages of this life journey, and she'll, he'll be bringing her home to celebrate uh, her life and to celebrate her eternal life. And so we want to keep that family in our prayers as, as she walks this final journey. All right, anyone else this morning? All right, let us center ourselves in the presence of a loving God, a God who, who walks this journey with us in every way possible. Holy and loving God, we come to you today and we pray in thanksgiving for all of the Johanna Williamses in this congregation who have sustained this church and nurtured it over the years. 
And there are so many names, you know them all, because now so many of them reside in the light and love of your presence. But now you call them beloved children. But when they were with us, we called them members of a congregation, members of a community, and we thank you for all of them. We thank you for their service, their dedication, and their sacrifice. Uh, we pray very much today for, for Roger as he walks this journey of grief. Uh, we thank you that your healing present has touched this family. And we pray now that your hand may be upon all who grieve. We know that suffering has been lifted. We know that pain is gone. Those who remain, cause them to know your love. Cause them to know your peace. Cause them to know your hope by the power of your spirit. Uh, we pray for the family of Velda Fitzgerald. She has now passed into eternal life after a, a long and purposeful life in this earthly journey. We pray that that family may be comforted by the legacy of a life lived well, of, of, a life of, of, of many decades, a life of many experiences, a life of many challenges, but a life lived well amid all of those struggles. And we pray now that the family and all who grieve can find great hope <coughs> in the promise in the promise of the resurrection. We pray for the Turnbull family as they walk these difficult final days of a journey. We pray that your hand may be upon this situation, granting all who walk this journey together to know a sense of peace, a sense of hope, and a sense of purpose. Today we pray with hearts of gratitude for all the women and men in organized labor, for the women and men in communities of faith that have stood together, to bring new protections in the workplace, to bring a sense of hope and peace to families, to provide, to provide for the building not only of this nation, but to provide for building of platforms of hope, voices of assurance and peace to families. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of confession, which can be found inside your bulletin. Holy God, your, your Son and Lord hypocrisy among those called to lead your people. For it is in the human heart that the truth of one's character resides. Yet we often speak as women and men of faith, and then reject the suffering, the outcast, the imprisoned, and the victims of hate-fueled actions. You are a merciful God. Forgive us for not being authentic witnesses of your truth and your grace. Renew our hearts so that we may be tireless messengers of the good news of your Son, our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We now enter into a time of stillness. Far more than just a time of silence, it's a time when we still our souls. And our souls are the way in which we actually view the world, the way in which we view the world through God's eyes, and the way in which God's image is reflected in our lives. And we need not debate the nature of the soul or soul and body together, all those other things, but it's simply understand it this way, it is the presence of God in our life and how they affect how, how we live. And I simply today, as we go to this time of stillness, I simply would ask us to reflect in our hearts, not in our minds, but reflect on one word. And it's a word we're going to talk about today in the message. That word is offering. And I'm not talking about a financial offering. I'm not talking about the giving of anything. I'm talking about a surrendering of a life. Put the word offering on your heart and allow God to speak to you in stillness as to what that should mean to you today.
we need to stop and think about this, that it is not about us, it is about what we are offering to God. We create so many concerns and anxieties as we try to control our circumstances, control one another, and avoid any kind of confrontation, all of those things. But what if we look at our life as an offering? You know, Paul will use the term a holy and living sacrifice, and we use that same term in the, the prayer of the, the great thanksgiving today. And that's really based on the ancient practice of sacrifice. But a more modern interpretation of that is the word offering. And what we're simply offering our lives unto God because our lives belong to God in the first place. Concentrate on that this week, reflect on that, and meditate on that, and you might get some interesting answers. We now enter into a time of prayers of the people. And that is a time when we are called to reflect upon what we are called to do as the body of Christ. Please respond to our prayer. God of abundant and enduring grace, may the church of your Son be a place of hospitality, a light of justice, and a beacon of hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for Salem United Methodist Church to continue our 179-year history of gospel-centered love, of gospel-centered mission, and of gospel-centered fellowship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the victims of natural disasters, of hurricanes, of wildfires, of flooding, of tornadoes, of all those things of nature that, that relate to the functioning of this planet, that they may be comforted by acts of compassion brought forth by your people, May your hand be upon them, granting them peace and nurturing them, and they may continue to know that despite the vagaries of nature, you are a God in command. You are a sovereign Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for victims of injustice, persecution, imprisonment, that they may find within the church of your Son a place of welcome, a place of action, and a place of service. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers for all who suffer, those who grieve, those who suffer physically, those who suffer emotionally, those who suffer the bondage of addiction, that your healing presence lived out through the body of your Son may, may be sources of hope, sources of healing, and sources of perseverance. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers. For those prayers residing only in the silence of our hearts and of our minds, where there is despair, may there be hope. Where there is doubt, may there be peace. And where there is fear, may there be love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. And we offer all these prayers in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. We now bring forward our gifts. Verses 12 through 21. Be joyful in hope, 
patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you are able for this morning's gospel reading. Today's gospel comes from Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus turned to his disciples. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. I grew up hearing the word hypocrite probably more than any other word in all of our family gatherings. My Aunt Jean, who you all know now very well, and hopefully someday we'll meet her in heaven, or maybe not, but the reality is that she had a name for everyone in their local United Methodist Church that somehow identified them as a hypocrite. Oh, the woman is the organist, but I saw her having lunch with a man that wasn't her husband last week. She's a hypocrite, okay? She called everybody from the pastor all the way down, and I'm sure in the back of her mind she was thinking the bishop is kind of a hypocrite as well. Now, my dad never used the term hypocrite, except when he referred to my Aunt Jean. <laughs> and there was a reason for that, because she was one of these people that is so caught up in this Christian hypocrisy that all of a sudden she made herself the judge and jury of everybody who walked through the doors of that local United Methodist Church. And she decided in her own mind who God loved. She decided in her own mind who God wanted in that kingdom. He just, she decided in her own mind who was good enough to do that. And here was the problem, though. The problem was that when you walk out of the doors on Sunday morning, you walk into the real world, and that's something Aunt Jean never understood. I've told you many times before that she fully believed heaven is like the hometown you grew up in, except there are no bars and bowling alleys. Oh. Because I know, it's kind of disappointing, isn't it? Yeah. I'm sort of looking forward to that in heaven. But that's how she thought. She really thought that when you're in the real world, let's face it, you're living in the real world. 
When you walk out the door today, you're going to go back to your homes and you're going to have issues you're thinking about. You're thinking about family, you're thinking about finances, you're thinking about, about retirement, you're thinking about relatives that are suffering, you're thinking about all these things in the real world, and here's the other thing you're thinking about. Somewhere out there, there are people that have hurt you. Somewhere in this world, there are people that have done you wrong. Somewhere in this world, there are people that have treated you unfairly. And I still think about that, and I'm a pastor. I should stand up here and say, I have no grudges anywhere in the world. I wish I could be like John Rado and never hold a grudge. <laughs> or tell a lie. <laughs> the reality is, we all hold grudges, don't we? We all have been hurt, because you know what? In these bodies that we offer unto God, we are human beings. We are human beings. Whenever you, and as you know, part of my career was in public life, whenever you are in public life, you are going to be hurt. Whenever you are in public life, you're going to be treated unfairly. Whenever you are in public life, you are going to depend basically on your career, on who wins an election, and that happened to me. And you know what? I'm still bitter, and I'm not going to lie about it. I'm still bitter and angry and upset and mad, but the point is, I have to live with that. And that's my humanity coming out, and I don't mind admitting it. I don't mind admitting that I still envy people. I don't mind admitting that I still feel guilty about stuff. I don't mind admitting that there are times I would like to go back and tell people how I really feel. And then ask them to feel God's blessing. No, not really. But there are times I would like to simply say, you know, what you did was wrong. What you did was not right. But that's not what Paul tells the church of Rome. That's not what he tells the church at all. And it points out the difficulty between our human personality, and we all have human personality, and the life that God has given us. It is the life that God that gives it, that God has given us that we are to use to reflect God's love. Now here's where it gets tricky, and this is where hypocrisy comes in. Because people try to make it too easy to do that. Okay? They make it sound like it's really easy. Oh, go out there and love your enemies. Now I don't think I have any real enemies in the world, but I certainly have people that are difficult. I certainly have people that are hard to understand their motivation, and yet I'm asked to love them? Is that easy? Is that easy to do? Is that easy to love someone who's, who's ripped your life away from you? Is that easy to love someone who's caused you to think less of yourself? Is that easy to do? The answer is no, because the life that God gives us is in a human body with human emotions. And you know, we do a lot of talking right now about what they call implicit biases, those unconscious thoughts where we make determinations about people and, and groups of people. So it's very, very hard to do that. It's very hard to continually show true love. It's very hard. Love is often conditional. What can you do for me today and I'm gonna love you? If you're making me happy,